sure. My pleasure. We're like excited. I said, and I love, love, love the physics teacher. <laughs> so Good. please say that out loud. We have physics. We have that same pro okay. program here where we everybody has to take physics. Okay. Remember to take it as a freshman. Okay. So, uh, yeah. and we get some pushback on that. Yeah. I bet. You know, it's hard. It is hard. Coming from the middle school and yeah. the freshmen and we're taking physics. Yeah. And, you know, we have some kids that are in the accelerated math program. And so, you know, we're pushing some of them, not all of them. They get advanced physics. They're taking physics. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, it is awesome. And, I, it, you know, we get a lot of pushback that from parents because she's at home with kids crying. Right. Doing homework, you know. Right. Yeah. But, but it's a big deal. It it's is. a big deal. So I think it's a one of the, the if not the most important things we do in our science program is that we have a physics instructor. Okay. So when I saw the physics thing, and I'm a chemistry teacher. <laughs> I love I was so excited. School. I know. I, I was so awesome. excited when I saw that. I'm like, ooh, looky there. <laughs> and you're here on Mole Day to boot. Uh, 1023. Didn't even think about that. Well, my excuse was that. <laughs> Hi, Zach. thing on. Okay, yeah, That's so. Flash change is 11.02. Right. We have a two-minute window. All right. As long as someone's watching the time, I guess I can watch it. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. we can watch it. Yeah. We can watch it. I can stand up and shut it off with the right time. Because I'll talk and then open it up in 20. It was from NASA, so yeah, I thought okay. it was probably right off, okay. Yeah. yeah. Right yeah. off the summary bio, so that's good. Just want to make sure yeah. we didn't type I it in the wrong copy, I just copy and paste it yeah, well that's from that's NASA. That's good. I'll let you guys up from here. All right. Again, we're ready to go. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome. This is, a, this is a pretty unique opportunity that we have, and so we want to make sure that uh, we get as much time uh, as possible. Um, so I'm going to take just this moment to introduce our guest speaker. Her name is Shannon Walker, and she is a Houston, Texas native. Uh, she was selected by NASA in 2004 to be part of the 19th class of astronauts. She holds a BA in physics, an MS, and a PhD in space physics from Rice University. Uh, Dr. Walker became, uh, began her professional career with the Rockwell Space Operation Company at the Johnson Space Center in 1987 as a robotics flight controller for the Space Shuttle Program. In 2010, she served as a flight engineer for the Expedition 2425, a long duration mission aboard the International Space Station that lasted 163 days. And so we'd like to give a warm welcome to Shannon Walker. Thank you. I'm happy to be here today. Um, so what I really wanted to do is talk a little bit about what it's like to train for a flight in space and then talk about what it's like to live and work on the International Space Station. Um, so I'll just get started at the end. I'll open it up to questions. So if you have any questions of things that uh, you're interested in, I'll be happy to answer it. All right. First off, American Space Shuttle. I did not fly on the space shuttle. Um, that was what NASA primarily got uh, astronauts to and from the space station for, for a very long time. But when I was selected, we were actually winding down the space shuttle program. And so I flew on a Russian Soyuz rocket. It's a little hard to see there. But I went and trained and lived over in Russia a lot to fly with the Russians up to and from the space station. So as your principal mentioned, I was born and raised in Houston, Texas. Houston does not have snow. It is a very, very warm, hot place to live. And so uh, going to Russia to train was a huge, huge change for me. Um, I actually had to buy a whole new wardrobe because I did not have anything for snow. I know you get snow here, but probably not like snow they get in Russia. Um, where we actually lived and trained is just outside of Moscow. It's a place called Star City. 
This was uh, originally one of a, what they called a closed city, which means it was um, private. It was not on the maps. The Russians or the Soviets at the time, it was part of the Soviet Union, had a secret space program. They were trying to keep information from the Americans. And so uh, nobody knew quite exactly where Star City was. But these days, it's much more open. We live there. This is where all the original cosmonauts and the current cosmonauts lived and trained. So it's a pretty historical place to be. But that's a picture of some of my colleagues and I working, walking to class in the morning. Um, another thing that was really hard for me in um, Russia was the fact that the sun would come up in the winter time at about 10.30 in the morning and go down about 3.30 in the afternoon. And so most of the days were dark. We do not have that in Houston at all. We've got a lot more sunshine. So it was a big shift in my world perspective, aside from just being cold all the time. Um, so. Most of the time when, um, well, all the classes we had in Russia were taught in the Russian language, and so I did have to learn how to speak Russian. Um, my Russian is not very good. It's very technical at this point. It's a definitely a perishable skill, but at the time, I could sit and listen to classes about technical subjects, learning about the spacecraft, learning how to fly the Soyuz rocket, learning how to operate on the Russian section of the space station, um, all in Russian. And then, of course, when I flew, when I launched to and from the space station on the Russian rocket, all our procedures, talking to the ground control station in Moscow, was all done in Russian. So um, also a little bit, uh, little bit of shift, um, trying to get away from speaking English all the time. But lucky for me, lucky for me, we didn't spend all our time in the cold, dark winter. Um, we actually went down and did some training at the Black Sea. And you'll see as I'm going through my uh, talk here about the kinds of training that we do, you'll see that we do, the vast majority of our training is what if something goes wrong. We're always training for what if something goes wrong, what if this doesn't happen right, and the reason being is that if everything goes according to plan, life is really smooth and it's very easy to operate, but if something goes wrong, being such a dangerous environment, you wanna be able to react quickly and you wanna know exactly what you need to do. So you, we train over and over for emergency um, situations. The training we did on the Black Sea was for the what if case, if something drastic happened on the space station and we had to get into our Soyuz spacecraft and come home immediately without planning like we do normally for a landing, um, we would just undock from the station, come back to Earth. Chances are we would land in the ocean somewhere because, of course, the Earth is mostly ocean. Um, luckily, the Soyuz floats, and so we've got procedures to save ourselves should that situation happen. So this is some of the training getting started. That little orange ball is the Soyuz capsule. It was one that has been in space, and now they use it for training. It's come back. Um, they will put that out in the ocean and then we practice our procedures. What does that really mean? Well, it means that inside that capsule where you got three people and you can see it's kind of small, we have to change into our survival gear and then figure out how to get out of the capsule uh, safely. So that's me learning how to fall out of the capsule into the water. Hopefully at some point uh, somebody would come along and rescue us in the middle of the ocean somewhere. These days, our, our tracking systems are pretty good, and so it wouldn't be too long until somewhere around the world they could say, all right, the Soyuz has landed over there, you ship, you helicopter, go pick them up and rescue the crew. Um, but we practice that, and it's kind of interesting, and I was thinking, boy, would that not be great to, uh, we're out in the ocean, we need to figure out how to get hoisted up by a helicopter, that would be a lot of fun to do. Unfortunately, they do not actually let us practice with the helicopters. Um, well, we go back to Star City, um, and they have a giant swimming pool there, and we practice that in a swimming pool. So they use us, they hook us up to a crane from the ceiling um, to show us how we're supposed to hold our bodies, because if you don't do it right, you can really hurt yourself getting lifted up out of a helicopter. And if you haven't seen, there's a really interesting YouTube video out there of this, this lady who was being rescued, and then the, all of a sudden she was in a basket and just starts spinning around and very dangerous and completely unpleasant if you're injured. But anyway, that's me getting hoisted up um, from the ceiling, and that is me wearing all the survival gear we have. So that orange suit on the outside is waterproof, so it's going to protect us from the water if we're bobbing around in the water somewhere. And underneath that suit is about four layers of thermal clothing. And the reason we need so much thermal clothing um, is chances are if we landed in the water, it's not going to be the nice warm Bahamas. Uh, most of the ocean is pretty cold, and so 
uh, we have to prepare if we learn, landed in the North Sea or something, landed in very cold water. So again, very tiny capsule, very tricky to get the choreography of how you get three people to change clothes inside this tiny little capsule and then get out to be rescued. Another thing we do in Russia, which we don't do in the US anymore, if you've seen any of the early uh, movies about the space program, Apollo 13, or uh, the series For All Mankind, um, the original one, not the one that's gonna be on Apple TV Plus here soon. Um, anyway, uh, early days, NASA would spin astronauts in a centrifuge. NASA decided we don't need to do that anymore, but the Russians still do it. Um, that blue structure there is a centrifuge. It does spin around. Um, that is the seat that I am in um, that they then put me into that ball on the end of the centrifuge, and then they spin it. This is a centrifuge spinning. It does not look like it's going that fast, but when it really cranks up, it will produce the effects of what it's like to launch and land in space. Specifically, it will reproduce the G-load. So how many times the force of gravity your body is gonna feel when you're launching or you're landing. Normally, during a launch and landing, you will get about four and a half times the force of gravity on your body. So imagine your friend that's sitting next to you is sitting on your chest, maybe two friends sitting on your chest, and that's what it feels like. And you've gotta be able to breathe while you're going through that situation, as well as operate the spacecraft. So we practice that. Um, in the centrifuge. In an emergency, if something goes wrong with the Soyuz and it decides to just go into its emergency, um, use its emergency procedures to come straight home, you can get up to eight or nine Gs. And so that's uh, enough G-force that it can make you pass out if you're not um, breathing properly during such a thing. So we practice that and actually it is truly the ultimate video game because um, I was actually trained as the co-pilot for the Soyuz spacecraft, which meant, um, I should explain, I'll back up a little bit. There's three people that launch and land in a Soyuz. The center person of that three is the commander. Uh, the person sitting to the commander's left, which was me, is considered the co-pilot. Um, so I was trained fully to launch, land, fly the spacecraft manually, everything all the way down to the ground. So one of the things we do in the centrifuge is practice uh, manual flying back to the ground. The centrifuge will actually react to the forces I'm putting in. So if I'm having a good day and we're trying to land at a particular spot on the earth and we have to fly the Soyuz to it, if I'm flying good, I can keep the G load down to maybe two and a half or three Gs. If I'm not having a good day, then the G load will crank up pretty high and I will feel those forces as I'm in, uh, flying around in the centrifuge. So that's, that's actually pretty cool to do. Um, this here is the Soyuz simulator that I spent a lot of time in. This is in Star City. Um, I'm sitting there with my colleague Sasha Skortsov. He is a Russian cosmonaut, and he and I did most of our simulator training together. When we first start out uh, training for a space flight, we spent a lot of time in the classroom learning about all the systems, learning about the systems of the Soyuz spacecraft, learning about the systems of the space station. Um, after we've got all the theoretical work done, um, we then move into a simulator, and so we spent hours and hours and hours in that simulator practicing launches, practicing landings, practicing rendezvousing and docking with the space station. And we, most of that practice is done, what if? What if your life support system fails? What if your atmosphere goes away? What if you have a fire in there? So you just practice failure situation, failure situation on top of it, maybe a series of failures. Oh, let's see, what if? Um, your engine doesn't burn at the right time and then it catches on fire. What are you going to do about it? So we spent a lot of time practicing. And you can see in there that it's a pretty, pretty, small, pretty small place. I'm not kidding when the Soyuz is, is pretty cozy. You can see I'm up on the, the top part over there. You can see that my knees are, are kind of up to my chest. And so just imagine sitting in that position for, for many hours at a whack um, doing a simulation after simulation. It gets pretty cozy. Um, Here's another picture of my colleague Doug Wheelock on the left there with me, and then me and Sasha in the Soyuz simulator in our pressure suits. These are the suits that we wear during a launch and during a landing, and during rendezvous too. So the reason we wear these is because this is what's going to protect us should something goes wrong in the Soyuz capsule. We sit in there, our uh, visors are down, we've got our gloves on, so we're in this completely enclosed suit that will provide us oxygen 
air to breathe uh, to keep us safe should there be a fire in the capsule and you know fire up you know smoke up the atmosphere or should we have a leak in the capsule and all our atmosphere leaks out those suits will keep us safe um, the reason we practice in them is because when you're all buttoned up in that suit it can be a lot harder to operate and you can see there that we're using paper procedures uh, these days we've actually moved on to tablets in the um, in the Soyuz, which is a whole other set of problems if your, your touch screen doesn't work or it's a little too sensitive. But um, at that time, we were using paper procedures. And trust me, it's a little bit hard to, uh, to turn your pages when you can't you know, like lick your finger and turn the page. So another reason we practice in there, just to make sure that we know what it's really going to be like when we actually launch. Uh, lucky for me, not all my training was in Russia. Um, the training period that, it, that I had to get ready for my flight was three years, and I spent a little bit over half that time in Russia. The rest of the time I spent around the rest of the world, uh, most of it in Houston. Uh, we also have our international partners in Europe, so I spent time in Cologne, Germany training. I spent time in outside of Montreal, Canada training with the Canadians, and then time in Scuba, Japan, which is outside of Tokyo uh, training with the Japanese. But in Houston, most of our training, aside from the systems on our part of the space station, we do a lot of training for spacewalks. And that is some of the most difficult training we do. This is a picture of me getting my crewmate, Tracy, uh, suited up for some of her training. Um, we get in these suits. They're, they're similar to the uh, pressure suits that we wear for launches and landings, but these suits will actually have your life support with you when you're doing an actual spacewalk. Um, we get buttoned up in the suits, they get put on a platform, and then we get lowered underwater into this giant swimming pool that we have at the Johnson Space Center. Um, and I do mean giant swimming pool. It is probably 100 feet wide, 200 feet long, and about 40 feet deep. And it's big enough to have uh, the model, a model of the entire space station underwater. So we practice underwater um, to do spacewalks. This is me in the suit. Um, you can see the suit's big and I'm pretty small in there, um, which is one of the reasons it's pretty physically demanding. Uh, on the ground, on Earth, the training suit probably weighs about 200 pounds. Um, in space, the suit would weigh the equivalent of about 800 pounds when you've got all the equipment on you for your life support. Um, of course, things don't weigh anything in space, but you still have the mass that you have to drag around. Um, and you definitely notice it when you're underwater. And you may be asking, why do we practice underwater for spacewalks? Well, the reason we practice underwater is because those suits, they have an atmosphere inside. They will actually float, even though they weigh about 200 pounds on the pool deck. Um, and so you can put weights on them to weigh you out so that you are neutrally buoyant. You are not floating up in the top of the pool, you are not sinking down to the bottom. You can pretty much stay in the middle of the pool and then you can simulate what it's like to work on the outside of the space station. Um, you'll see all that equipment that's in front of me. Those are all the t where we store the tools that we use to operate on the space station. It kind of makes it hard because it makes your work envelope pretty short and if you've got short arms like I do, it makes it even more difficult to operate. But we do practice that. Um, what's interesting, to me about being in the water, it's, it is very much like being on the outside of the space station up to a certain point. You still have gravity in the swimming pool, so if you're upside down, uh, all the blood's gonna rush to your head and that's a pretty uncomfortable position to be in to try and work. Um, but you also have the water, the effects of water, so the water creates drag. So underwater, it's really, really hard to get you moving to where you go. And I should point out that the term spacewalk is a complete misnomer. There is no walking in space. Um, you are moving around by your arms and your hands. And so you have to have a lot of strength and a lot of endurance in your, in your arms, especially your forearms, to do the spacewalks. So uh, the water makes it hard to start moving to where you need to go the water makes it very easy to stop because it will, the drag will just slow you down. Not like at all in space where you don't have any of that resistance on you. Um, so we do have some other training and I'll show you in just a second about how we, how we get around that, how we simulate more of what it's like to be in space. The last thing I wanted to say here is the training that we do when we're in these suits, 
We are underwater for about six hours at a time. A spacewalk is probably going to be about seven hours when you actually do one in space. Uh, six hours is a long time. There is no lunch in the suit, so you better have a really good breakfast because six hours hauling around a couple of hundred pounds plus yourself um, takes a lot of fuel. So strength and endurance is very important, um, uh, very important for astronauts. So what we do to simulate the actual space conditions outside of a suit is we actually get hung from the ceiling. We get hung from ceilings a lot in our training. But in this particular case, they do this because um, you've got to figure out when you're outside of the space station how you're going to do the work you're going to do, how you're going to hang on, how you're going to brace your body uh, for the physics students in here. Yay, physics. Um, you know, you've got Newton's laws. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So that giant wrench that I've got in my hand, if I am trying to tighten a bolt this way, my body's going to go that way. The station's going to want to move some because of the torque applied through the bolt. And so you've got to figure out how you're going to hang on and get the work done that you need to do. Uh, it's, it's a little challenging, but hanging from the ceiling in this case is a little fun too. Um, another thing we do that we can't practice on the ground uh, because of gravity is we use virtual reality for some of our training associated with spacewalks. Um, this is a NASA built set. It is before, we built it before HoloLens, before Oculus Rift, before anything that has come out these days. And so that's why it looks the way it does. But inside, I've got a model of the space station and what we're training there is the what if scenario of what if I come off the space station. We have tethers that we're tied to the space station the whole time, but tethers can break. Um, thankfully they never have, but you have to be prepared. What if you start floating away from the space station? What are you going to do about it? Well, on the uh, space suits that we wear on the outside, we actually have jetpacks that are attached to it. And so this is me figuring out how to fly the jetpack with me back to the space station. And it's a little bit tricky on how you do that. Um, there's not a lot of gas, so you have to be really efficient in your flying. Um, again, if you've got any physics majors in here who have dealt with orbital mechanics, how things rotate in space, how you fly. You don't fly in a straight line, and it can be a little tricky. If you're here and you want to go there, you kind of have to fly this direction to get where you need to be. And again, you don't have a lot of gas. So we practice that using virtual reality, which is pretty cool. Um, the other training we do, um, we train a lot inside the modules, getting prepared. Um, you'll see in the picture on the right that we have a CPR dummy in front of us. Uh, we do get trained in medical procedures, basic medical procedures. You're never guaranteed to fly with a medical doctor. We do have astronauts that are medical doctors, but um, there's not one on station all the time. And so we have to be trained to take care of any medical emergency that might come up. Thankfully, we haven't had any, but we are trained to do everything from give shots, to do stitches, to take care of broken bones, to do minor um, uh, dental procedures, and a few other things <coughs> that you probably don't want to know about, catheters. Um, and so we practice that. If there's an actual emergency, the astronauts can stabilize, certainly stabilize, if not take care of the situation on the station. If something is more serious, we've got doctors on the ground that we can call uh, to help us. <clears throat> and if something were really, really serious, which again, we've never had anything like that, we would just take the injured person, the sick person, whatever, put them in the Soyuz capsule and come home. Hopefully we could have a little more planning so we wouldn't have an injured person bobbing around in the ocean somewhere, we would land somewhere on land where people could get us. But we do practice all of that. Another thing we practice a lot, the big what ifs. What if something catches on fire on the space station? We do a pretty good job of maintaining what kind of materials that go up there so we don't have too much flammable stuff. But given enough, uh, <coughs> given the proper conditions, just about anything can burn. And so, um, so we practice what happens. Well, the space station, it's 20 years old. It's probably one of the original smart homes that we have out there. The smoke detectors, there are smoke detectors all over the space station. If a smoke detector detects a fire before an astronaut detects a fire, it'll start trying to shut things off. Um, you want to get rid of the source of the fire, which is probably going to be electrical somewhere. And so it's going to turn off all the electricity. There goes all your lights. There go all your fans, which is circulating the atmosphere. So you're in the dark, um, in a smoky atmosphere. You've got to figure out where are my crewmates, are they safe? 
Are they, are they injured? Um, where are the flashlights? Because I can't see anything, because all the lights are out. Um, how big is the fire? You know, we've got to get everybody together and then decide, oh, and get our gas masks on, because who knows what is actually breathing? It could be quite toxic to you, aside from just being a smoke-filled module, which, of course, you cannot open the window and let the smoke out. You're going to have to deal with it. So get your gas mask on, find your crewmates, figure out, are we going to fight this fire? Because we do have fire extinguishers up there. Or is it so serious that we just need to close the hatch and close off that part of the space station and let it burn itself out and deal with it later? Um, so we practice fires. And as you can see, we actually practice fires. They are able to pump smoke into the modules that we have um, in our training facilities and make it very realistic. All right. It's been nearly three years of training, a lot of classroom training, a lot of time in simulators all over the world. Um, this is my Soyuz crew that I actually launched with uh, at the very end of our training in Houston. Um, this was our last training event. Got to take the happy pictures before we go. Once we're done here, we actually go back to Russia, go back to Star City to do about two months more of training before we actually launch into space. And the reason we do it that way is because the final training we do is going to be on the Soyuz spacecraft that is an extremely dangerous kind coming and going. And so we want the most recent training to be freshest in our minds before we actually launch into space. Once we're done with that training there, we go to Kazakhstan for our actual launch. You may be wondering why Kazakhstan, why not Russia? Uh, the reason Kazakhstan, a couple of reasons. It was part of the former Soviet Union when they started their space program. Kazakhstan, uh, where we launch out of, is a big, giant desert area. And so it's a relatively safe place to launch from um, in that there are no people around that could be injured should there be an accident. So we launch out in the middle of the desert in Kazakhstan. This is us arriving, um, arriving there. You can kind of get a glimpse. There'll be some other pictures where you can see what uh, Kazakhstan that part of Kazakhstan looks like. Um, but like I said, it's a, it's a big desert. We get to Kazakhstan about two weeks before our launch. Um, the reason we get there about two weeks before launch uh, is twofold. One, we're in quarantine. So we are separated from pretty much everybody else. Uh, the people that do have contact with us have been seen by doctors. They separate us out because they don't want us to take any diseases up to space station. Two weeks gives just about every disease that, you know, common colds, flus, things like that, that will run its course, present itself. You make sure you're healthy before you launch because we got crew on the space station that you're gonna be launching to go see and you just don't want sick crew on the space station. So that's one reason we're there for about two weeks. The other reason is we've got some final fit checks that do, that have to happen to make sure everything is okay with our real spacecraft. So there we are. Um, this is about four days before we launch. We're in our actual spacesuits uh, instead of the ones that we have been training with and the actual spacecraft that uh, Cyrillic there says Soyuz. Um, if you don't know Cyrillic, uh, it says Soyuz, which means unity um, in the spacecraft. So that's what they've called their spacecraft, which I think is pretty neat because this Soyuz spacecraft was actually developed back in the 50s, the time of the Cold War, um, where the US and Russia were not friends or frenemies like we are today. Um, but they still called it Unity, and all these years later, we are launching together, um, unified for the space station. So I think that's pretty cool. Anyway, so there we are, uh, just in front of our spacecraft. As soon as we're done with the checks that we were doing, the Russians take the spacecraft that's in the vertical position, they rotate it on its side, they integrate it onto the rocket that day. The next day, they will roll the rocket out to the launch pad. So just a couple of days before we launch, uh, they put it on a train, that's my rocket right there, and take it out. It's about a mile away uh, that they take it out to the launch pad. Business end of the rocket, those are the engines that get us into space. They're pretty impressive. You got one central core and then four sets of engines around that that uh, provide all the power to get into space. <coughs> Excuse me. Out at the launch pad, the rocket's in the horizontal. They crank it up into the vertical. There it is, almost ready to go. The day before launch, they'll start putting fuel into it. Then we come out and we go. Um, this is us just before we go out to the launch pad. We launched about 3.30 in the morning because that was the time dictated by where the space station was um, going overhead. These are the same things that the Russians did 
from the very first one, the crew goes out, presents themselves to Russian management. They say, okay, go launch. We go to the rocket, we get in, and we go. Um, as you might imagine, a lot of noise, a lot of vibration, a very, very, very exciting ride up into space. Um, it'll be a little bit bright here. You won't see it very well because it is freakishly bright when the engines are burning. Um, you'll see a picture here of the crew on the space station. They are watching video of us launching, and so they're excited for us to come up. Um, after we launched, it takes eight and a half minutes to get into space, which is a pretty intense, quick ride. Um, and then we spent two days catching up with the space station. And so that's us doing some of our rendezvous maneuvers as we're getting close, catching up the space station. That's a picture of the Soyuz from the space station. This is what the space station looks like from the Soyuz. It is an amazing structure in space. It is huge. It is beautiful. It is a great place to work. So we slowly get uh, creep up to the space station. We run into it. We dock. We do leak checks. And then a few hours after we dock, we open the hatches and we can go inside and greet our friends. That uh, there was Sasha Skortsov, who I did most of my training. He launched about two months before I did. And so it was really neat to see my friends um, in space that I had spent so much time training with. So three years, three years of training around the world, three years of jet lag training around the world. Um, now I'm in space. Who am I in space with? Well, the whole time I was there, we had three Americans, three Russians. These are the three Russians that were with me at the beginning of my uh, time. Up in the upper left-hand corner is Misha Kornienko. Uh, you may have heard about a time where we had an astronaut do a year in space, Scott Kelly. Um, Misha Kornienko was his cosmonaut counterpart, so this was not the time that he was spending a year in space, but this was his first, first flight into space, and so on a second trip, he stayed a year. Uh, Sasha Skortsov in the lower left, who I did most of my training with, and then your, uh, Fyodor Yoshikin, who was the Soyuz commander that I flew up with. The two other Americans, Tracy and Doug, who are, you saw in some of the earlier pictures. All right, what do we do in space? Well, that's a good question. Every day is different. Um, each morning we wake up and overnight, the control centers around the world have uplinked a schedule to us and we do what they tell us to do. Um, and it can be anything. This particular day, the ground wanted Tracy and I to move piece of equipment from the ceiling to the floor. I have no idea, but that's what I needed. And you can see as you're moving heavy stuff around, you're not standing on the floor. You're probably standing on the wall. You may be standing on the ceiling to get the work uh, done that you needed to do. That particular piece of equipment probably weighs on the ground 300 pounds, two, 300 pounds, very easy to move around in space. Most of the time, however, uh, we are doing science up there. Uh, that is the purpose of the space station, science. Uh, if you can think of a scientific or engineering field, we probably have an experiment going on on the space station, studying some aspect of that. Um, when I was up there, I think we had on the order of 130, 35 different experiments going. So we did all kinds of stuff. Um, in this particular case, this was a fluids experiment looking at how to get, how to make better fuel tanks for spacecraft, which sounds like a very curious thing to study, but the reality is um, fuel tanks on the ground, like the fuel tank getting your gas to your car engine, that is gravity fed. That will not work in space where you do not have gravity to m move fuel. So they use surface tension of the, ins the inside of the fuel tank. So how do you make it better to be efficient while you're uh, flying your engines and rockets around? Um, this on the left is a picture. We actually have a freezer up there. Actually, I have a couple of freezers. What do we use freezers for? Well, astronauts are also medical test subjects. Um, so we, they do a lot of medical experiments on us, which is great. Um, but they want to understand how the body works in space. So they are always looking at different aspects. And so while we're up there, we have to donate a lot of blood. Donate. Donate a lot of blood. We take urine samples. Um, once we take these samples, we freeze them. And the next time there is a spacecraft that is actually going all the way to the ground. Most of them burn up in the atmosphere. That's how we get rid of our trash. Um, but in a spacecraft that's going to the ground, we'll take those frozen samples, send them back to the ground, and then they can get to the um, investigators that are looking at whatever they're looking at in our blood and urine. Um, a lot of times we're just assembling stuff for investigators on the ground. We put it together, they operate it from the ground. Uh, this particular case, I was assembling something that I believe we were looking at better smoke detector technology, both for uh, in space and on the ground. Obviously fires are very important to 
be aware of, especially when you're in space. And so every few days I would go in and change out the samples of things that they were burning to look at their smoke detectors. This uh, experiment here, that's uh, me in the foreground. You got Doug in the background. I'm in the um, Japanese uh, experiment module. I'm doing a biology experiment for the Japanese. They are looking at how plants grow with good water sources and bad water sources. The only reason I put this in here just to sort of demonstrate when you're in space and you can't reach what you need to do, it's very easy to get where you need to go to do the work you need to do. That is one of the best things about being in space is being able to float around. Um, here we're learning how to fly satellites better. So it was more of a programming challenge. Um, and we flew these little satellites around on the inside. When we're not doing science, um, we do have a little bit of spare time. Our days are pretty long, but whenever we have spare time, we do like to look out the window. The Earth is the most amazing, beautiful place from space. You cannot even imagine how neat it is. It's a little hard to see, but this is a picture of um, me when we're flying over the Bahamas. Um, one of the neatest things that we have on the space station is this, this area called the cupola. It is basically a 360 degree window that's on the bottom of the space station, so we can always look at the Earth, of what's going on. You can see the curvature of the Earth on the left, and if this, um, if this showed up better here, you would see how many different shades of blue in the water there are um, in the Bahamas. Pretty amazing place. Sunrises and sunsets, also amazingly beautiful. I, you know how pretty they are on the ground from space. They are absolutely stunning. We are flying fast. We are flying around the Earth once every 90 minutes. That means we get 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets on Earth Day, which is pretty amazing. So there's always something neat to look at from sunrises and sunsets. I was up in space um, from June to November, so right across hurricane season in the northern hemisphere. Pretty amazing. It was a very, very active hurricane season. And so looking at these um, massive storms uh, it was pretty impressive. Looked pretty calm from space, but growing up in Houston where I have had multiple hurricanes go over the Houston area that I know how dang dangerous and destructive they are. So it was pretty cool to see them and see how big they are in space. And again, you can see the curvature of the earth there. Um, fires, forest fires. It was a very active fire season that year. I don't know why, but you could see fires all over the world on um, just about every continent was having fires. What was really neat about these, you can see the smoke plume come up. You can see it sort of spread out. But from space, you can see it spread out across the continent you're on. It will go across the ocean next to it, and it will go all the way over to the next continent over. And so seeing these forest fires from space really showed how connected the Earth is, even though it's not obvious always on the ground. When you see from the space how one thing that happens in one part of the world definitely affects the other part of the world because we're connected through this tiny little atmosphere, really drives home the point of how much we need to take care of our Earth. And I know you guys know that, but it's very easy to see how stark it is when you're in space. This is one of my favorite pictures. My colleague Doug took that. Any guesses where we are? I hear the adults. It's the Nile. I think I heard that out there. So I like this picture for a number of reasons. So the Nile is just pretty neat looking, looking at the, the Middle East there. Um, it also is a really good indication. I mean, the Earth at night is, is beautiful. You see the lights, but you see, obviously, the lights where people live. Well, where do people live? Well, they live where they've got decent water or water to drink. Out in the deserts there to the west, there are not very many people. Um, I also really like this picture because you can see just at the top this little greenish-yellow arc over the Earth. That is our atmosphere. That is how tiny our atmosphere is. It seems like we got a lot of it from when, when we're down here. We really don't. Again, it really shows how connected and how tiny and how fragile our Earth is. Um, at the top of that, which you can't see, there are a bunch of stars. I also often get the question, do you see stars in space? Yep, when it's nighttime, you see stars, and you see just a stunning amount of stars from space. Um, Northern lights, southern lights, I get to see both from up there. Pretty amazing, um, really beautiful. Here's some time-lapse photography of us going around the night side, flying through some of the northern lights. You can see the solar rays from the space station rotating there, going around to catch the sun again. You can see how the northern lights shimmer and change um, as they go, as we go around. And you can see our tiny little atmosphere. And soon you will see the sun come up, 
you should be able to see a whole massive amount of stars as we're getting into closer to daylight and then, um, then sunrise, and then you can't see it anymore until you get back around them onto the night side. It's pretty cool. So looking at the Earth never gets old from space. After about four months, it was time for the crew that was up there, the three people that were up there when we launched, it was their turn to go home. So we said our goodbyes to them. They got into their Soyuz, they came home. 12 days later, another crew came up again to um, round out the compliment to have us three Americans, three Russians while we were up there. These are the three that came up. Uh, Russian on the left is Sasha Kaleri. The guy in the middle, that's Scott Kelly. This was his first trip, uh, long duration to the space station. His next flight, he was the one that stayed for a year. Um, on, the, on the far right there is Oleg Skripochka. Um, he actually launched into space again about a month ago, so he is on the space station right now. So I've talked a little bit about living. No, I've talked a little bit about training and the science that we do and looking out at the Earth. What else? What else? Where do we live? What is it to, I like to actually live there? Well, we've got um, these areas called that we call crew quarters. Um, they're a little bit kind of about the size of a British phone booth, actually a little bit smaller, but that's where our personal space is. And so we've got four of these crew quarters on the U.S. built side of the space station, two down on the Russians. And so this is where we sleep at night. This is where we can uh, check our email. This is where we can make phone calls to our families and friends. Um, but as you can see, in space it doesn't matter. We have two on the walls, one in the floor, one in the ceiling. Um, it really doesn't matter because you've got no effects of gravity. So it's the orientation is not important. Inside we do have a sleeping bag, so we sort of float inside a sleeping bag at night uh, when we sleep. This is us getting together for dinner. Uh, the space station is big. Um, you can go all day and work in a module and never see your crewmates, and so my crews would get together every night for dinner. One night we would get together for dinner on the U.S. side. This is where we are here. The next night we would get together um, in the Russian segment, and we would all share our food together. Um, and we would just, you know, it's just like a normal family. What did you do today? You know, what's new with you? What have you heard from home? Things like that. And then you can see our little speed limits there. We are going 17,500 miles an hour um, or 28,000 kilometers an hour. We should probably do metric system here. Anyway, so sort of a little bit of daily life there. One thing in space, just like home, you cannot escape your chores. We do have chores in space. Pretty much every Saturday is clean the station day. I took a video of what it's like to vacuum in space because we do a lot of vacuuming. Um, it's a little different, a little bit more fun in, in, in space than at home. Um, a little challenging too, you've got to hold on with one hand, you've got to vacuum with the other, and you've got to carry that vacuum cleaner around with you and not knock it into stuff, which is why I carry it between my knees. The electrical cord that is curled up behind me is actually pretty strong, and the fact, and if I were not holding on, it would just pull me back to the module, next module over where it was plugged in. So a little challenging, but a lot more fun. Um, cleaning in space. We would, do, we would goof off when we had a chance. Usually Sundays were, was free time, um, Sunday afternoon, so we could get together and, and play a little bit. I spread some bungees out on the floor and made a little trampoline, which was fun to bounce on. Uh, here, my colleague Doug and I try and do the do, -si -do. We were always trying to go back the way we came, and he was constantly throwing me off into the walls. Um, I think we had a little mass differential problem there or he was just not good at dancing. I don't know. Um, so that was fun to do. Here's a video of me. I'm trying to have a serious video discussion with the ground, and, and then Doug and Tracy are goofing off in the background. Um, and in this one, Tracy was actually a member of a band, and we had a video conference, and we were having a jam session singing along with her band. So a little variety of ways that you can entertain yourself when you're in space. Um, another thing that we do that is uh, hugely important is exercise. That is how we stay healthy. Um, we, ex we are scheduled to exercise two and a half hours every day, and it's very important that you do. Um, we have this machine here, which is the equivalent of lifting weights in space. Of course, you can't lift weights in space because nothing weighs anything. Um, but you are pushing against a vacuum, and this vacuum, those vacuum cylinders that you can't really see, you can dial up the equivalent weights. And so we do a lot of lower body exercises because those are where your big bones are. We do some upper body exercises uh, to keep our bones and muscles strong. We also have a treadmill. It is on a wall like that. You have a harness, 
to keep you on the treadmill. This is how we exercise our cardiovascular system. Of course, the muscle, the heart is a muscle, so it's important to exercise that. And we have an exercise bike. Um, you can see in space, no need for a helmet, no need for a seat. So your feet are just uh, clipped into the pedals there. So that's how we exercise. Usually each day we're doing weightlifting and one of the cardiovascular things. Another question I get a lot, do you sweat in space? Yes, you're exercising every day. You do sweat in space. It's not quite the same in that on the ground, uh, you know, your sweat will drip off, it'll roll down your nose, whatever, get into your eyes. In space, it doesn't do that. It just kind of builds up in this ball on your face, which is kind of icky, but um, that's just the way it is. So you gotta clean up. We do not have a shower in space. So to clean our bodies, we use uh, wipes equivalent to baby wipes. They actually do pretty well. You stay pretty clean in space. Um, washing your hair can be a little tricky. The guys have it a lot easier if they keep their hair short, which most of them do. Those of us that had longer hair, it's a little more challenging. So I made a video of what it's like to wash your hair in space. Um, we have shampoo up there that's like you use in hospitals. It's dry shampoo. Um, you sort of dot it on your hair and rub it around a bit, and then you'll get a bag full of water. Um, and then you will dot that on your hair too. The water and shampoo will stick to your hair because of the surface tension. Um, you just work it out to the ends of your hair as best you can. Then you get a towel, you wipe it off, and then you do sort of water towel, water towel, water towel until you feel like it's clean enough. No hair dryers in space either. So it's just gonna be a big Medusa mess um, of your snake locks of hair. Come it out as best you can. And then uh, this is what I like to call being space beautiful. There we go. So, daily life in space. Um, fun, challenging at the same time. Um, after six months, it was our turn to come home. Uh, so we said goodbye to our colleagues that were up there. Um, we got into our Soyuz. Uh, they closed the hatch behind us. We undocked from the space station. Um, we go around the Earth about one time. We burn our engines and then we come back through the atmosphere. Another very exciting ride coming home. At the upper reaches of the atmosphere, actually at about, actually it's not that high, about 10,000 meters, 33,000 feet up, a giant parachute comes out, we ride the parachute down to the ground, you smack into the ground pretty hard, it's like a little car crash, we bounced, um, and then uh, the Russian search and rescue team comes and takes us out of the capsule. We actually land in the middle of Kazakhstan, again, a big desert area where no people are around, so if you're slightly off course, you won't run into anything. They do pull you out of the Soyuz so you don't hurt yourself. They put you in these chairs. My chair was on a tuft of grass, so I was tilted. They gave me a satellite phone so I could call my husband. Hey, honey, I'm home. Um, sort of. Um, then they check us out uh, with the medical doctors. We're all wrapped up in blankets there. I landed what would be Thanksgiving Day in Houston. It was the day after Thanksgiving in Kazakhstan, um, just below freezing, so they wanted to keep us warm. Uh, we get checked out by doctors, and then we have this whole planes, trains, and automobiles thing to get back to our home countries. So they take us over to these all-terrain vehicles. You see one in the background. They drive the all-terrain vehicles to these giant helicopters. We get in these giant helicopters that fly about two hours to the nearest city. Um, at the airport there, there are two airplanes waiting. There is a NASA plane that's gonna take the NASA um, astronauts back to the Johnson Space Center in Houston, and there is a Russian plane that's gonna take the cosmonauts back to Star City outside of Moscow. Then, then about 24 hours after we land, we are finally, finally home. And that's when the doctors then take over and poke and prod us and harass us for a couple of hours before we actually get a good night's sleep. This is the last picture I have. This is the inside of a Soyuz. I promised <laughs> um, that it was very cozy. You can see how cozy it is when we're all in there with our equipment that we have. Uh, those bags hanging between us are the emergency equipment that we have, the clothes that we need to change into should we end up in the water. Um, anyway, so that's my crew just before we came home. So that's what I wanted to share with you, a little bit about training for flights, what it's like to live in space. Um, I hope you found it interesting, and at this point, if you have any questions, I would be happy, happy to answer questions. Yes, sir. How does being in space affect my sleep schedule? Well, it doesn't, in some sense. Um, the space station operates on Greenwich Mean Time, and so we keep <clears throat> regular days, even though we're 
zipping around the earth all the time, it kind of feels like you're in an office building. So unless you go look out the window, you don't know what, what the daylight is doing outside. Um, so we typically get up about six in the morning, about 7.30 or so, we check in with all the control centers around the world. Um, we have a control center in Houston. Uh, we have a control center in Huntsville, Alabama, actually, that uh, takes care of all the experiments. There's a control center in Germany, there's a control center in Japan, and then of course there's the one in Russia. So we check in with all of those. They give us whatever instructions that we need for the day. We have about an 11 hour work day. At the end of the night, we check in with them again, uh, even though we're talking to them during the day. And that's probably about seven o'clock at night. We have time for dinner when we get together. 9.30 at night, we're supposed to go to bed. Uh, they give us, they allot us eight and a half hours at night to sleep. Or, so that's how the days are organized. They try and keep it Monday through Friday. Um, weekends, half a day of work on the weekends. Most of it is, is cleaning the station. Sometimes we have other science things that we need to do. And then Sundays, they usually try and give us off when they can unless we have to do spacewalks or unless spacecraft are coming up. Um, but that's typically when we would do video conferences with our families. So it's pretty good, pretty good schedule up there. Yeah, there. Yeah, did a, by the end, was I tired of zero gravity or being on the space station after six months? No. Um, zero gravity is a lot of fun. Uh, that, I was not bothered by at all. Um, if they had told me that I needed to stay longer, I would have happily stayed longer in space. I was also happy to come home. Um, it's not the being there that you miss, it's the friends and family, it's the things that you don't think about on the earth. You don't ever feel the sun on your face, you don't feel any breeze, you don't feel, you know, you can't smell the grass and the flowers and things like that. So it was nice to come home to that. And in fact, when they opened the hatch in, uh, in Kazakhstan, even though it was just below freezing, you could smell the grass and you could smell flowers. And it was a really um, intense feeling to um, not be in the sterile confines of space. So back there, yeah. What was it like to start walking after I got back? Well, it's a very interesting process when you come back. Um, the biggest thing you notice is your inner ear is very confused and very angry with you. Your inner ear, if you don't know, is what gives you your balance. It works off of gravity. So it has adjusted to life without gravity. And when it comes back, uh, it's just like, I don't know what's going on. And so you are incredibly dizzy very unpleasantly dizzy. So dizzy, you cannot walk a straight line. If you've ever done like that dizzy bat game where you, you know, go around a bat and then try and walk, that's what it feels like. It is horrible. Um, because we exercise every day, we're really strong. So we've got certainly the strength to do it. It's just your body's not going to cooperate. Um, so for me, fortunately, after a few hours, the dizziness started going away. Um, but walking can still be problematic because you still just don't have full control. You haven't walked, other than being on the treadmill, you haven't actually walked much. And so you kind of have to relearn how to do that. Um, we actually have athletic trainers that we work with after we come back. Um, actually, even before we go, because we need to be in shape for the spacewalks. Um, and so they work with us, not so much on the strength side, but on the how do you get your balance back side because it, that can take a really long time. And it can take months before all the aches and pains go away um, from being in space. It's pretty hard on the body coming back. Other questions? Any questions over here? Yes. Yeah, does every crew do things differently? Yeah, each crew kind of has their own their own approaches to things. I mean, there's some things you can't do differently. You gotta do the work that you, you do, but how you socialize amongst yourselves can be different. Some crews uh, maybe wouldn't eat dinner together every night, maybe just a couple of times a week. Um, these days we've got a screen and a projection system up there. So you can have movie night with your crewmates. We did not have that capability when I was up there. We could watch movies on a laptop, but it's a little hard to get six people around a laptop to work. So yeah, there's some, there's some differences how they make it their own space and life up there. Yes, sir. How often do you go up in space? As often as the boss will let you go up in space. Um, so early days in the, the shuttle era, when we were flying lots of shuttle missions, um, they would stay up about two weeks at a time. 
you would fly maybe four or five times in a career. It would probably, for a shuttle mission, you would train for a year, year and a half, you do your mission, then you'd wait for your next opportunity. These days, the turnaround time isn't quite as fast. Um, we are flying, well, up until this year, uh, flying four Soyuz launches a year, which means we fly um, with our international partners four Americans a year into space, which is not that much. We've got roughly 40 astronauts, and so your time is about once every 10 years that you'll get to fly in space. But it's worth it because you're up there for six months. It's worth the wait for sure. Yes. Did the whole crew speak both Russian and English? Yes. Yes, the Russians have to learn English and the other partners have to learn Russian. The official language on space station is English, um, but a lot of the equipment in Russia have, has labels in Russian. Um, of course, flying on the Soyuz, you need to know Russian. And then like most international groups, you kind of figure out where in the middle it makes sense to speak. Sometimes the words just make more sense in Russian, so you just speak that activity in Russian, and sometimes you just talk in English. It just depends. So, yep, but we're speaking both up there. Other questions? Oh, yes, sorry. Any meditation for anxiety? No, they don't really teach that, um, which is an interesting question. A lot of people ask about the sort of psychological effects or, um, and it can be hard on people being separated from their families for so long. Most people that are, that apply to be an astronaut and are selected are people that want to do this kind of exploration mission. And so um, that is not going to be perhaps such as an issue as it might be um, in the general population. But um, everybody has their own methodology to, um, to stay happy. Um, we, our days are really busy. And so if you're someone that likes to focus on work, it's really easy to do what you need to do. We do have a team on the ground called our psych support team. We have uh, psychiatrists that are available and work with us. And then we have people that um, do the small things that make life a little bit better, such as sending up movies and television shows. So when you do have time, like if when you're running on a treadmill, if you're running on a treadmill for 45 minutes, um, staring at a wall, that is just not fun at all. So we could pop up a TV show once you remove the commercials, they're 42 minutes long, and it's about you know length of one good workout. So um, we have people to support us in those ways. Yeah, one of the more interesting studies I worked on, um, you know, they're all a little bit different. I think some of the ones where I was a test subject is interesting. One of the ones that I actually haven't seen the final report on, it takes many years to get Enough, enough people through, but they were doing a study on how the salt affects the body. We know salt is bad for you cardiovascularly, but salt also leaches bone density. And so it's usually important to astronauts because you're constantly losing bone density up there, but it's also important for uh, people affected by osteoporosis. And so I just thought that was an interesting thing to do. And they were looking at how diet affects that. So I would eat a certain diet for a period of time, and then I would give my blood and urine, and then they would take it back and check whatever they're checking. What was my biggest worry? I don't think I really had any worries other than things like, is my husband doing okay? I mean, I wasn't scared to be in space. We had trained all those what ifs. Nothing that can go wrong up there will affect you that quickly. I mean, some things you do have to react quickly, but I knew we were prepared for those. So it wasn't, didn't have a whole lot of worries up there. Life is pretty simple in some sense because you you're being told what to work i mean i guess if you don't like being told what to do every day that could be a problem but you know your life is planned out so it's it's a pretty simple existence in space i say yes sir what made me want to go to space well it was the space program that made me want to go into space early days so um i was four years old when we landed on the moon and i have memories of my parents taking uh, me and my older sister out into the backyard with the moon coming up over our house and them saying that we have people there. And I just thought that sounded like a great idea. And so that's what gave me the inspiration to do it. There's another, yes. 
Yeah, do political tensions translate up to space? No, they don't. Um, in spite of all the yammering that goes on between the countries, and especially US and Russia right now, really does not translate down. Um, the people that you work with at the engineering level, the worker bee level, all have the same passions. They know that doing space travel internationally is the right answer for the world. It's too expensive and too complicated these days for countries to go it alone. Um, and so it's just, it's just noise that we ignore what's going on. So, yes. Mm -hmm. Have I ever seen any UFOs? Nope, never seen any UFOs, sorry. Um, well, the spacewalk, I was not fortunate enough to do a spacewalk. Um, there, weren't, there was only one planned when I was there. My crewmates were packed for it. Usually what spacewalks, in the early days of the space station, they were there to assemble the space station. So once you get the two modules together, you've got to hook up the electrical connections, the fluid connections, things like that. Uh, these days, all the spacewalks, are, the vast majority of them are to make repairs on the outside or to make improvements on the space station. Way back there. What do we do with our garbage? Good question. So we've got cargo ships that come up regularly to bring supplies such as food um, uh, and all the experiments that we do. So we unload those cargo ships and we fill it with our trash. Um, once they're filled and it's scheduled time for them to undock, they undock from the space station and they're put on a trajectory so they burn up in the atmosphere. So we burn up our trash. Any other questions? I thought I saw another hand over here. Nope. Yes. Besides what? Besides, yeah, that's pretty much the favorite thing about being in space. It's just so cool. Um, yeah, it's just, it's a, it's a really neat place to live and to work because of zero gravity. And so it's just, it's just a treat to be there. I wish everybody could experience it. It's neat. Yep. What was my what? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. My favorite food to eat. Yeah, I get that question a lot. Um, so because we're an international space station, we have international food, which was really good. Um, the Japanese had this really yummy curry. So Japanese curry was one of my favorites. Um, on the American side, we actually send up some barbecue beef, which was pretty good. I'm from Texas, so I've got to have the barbecue. Um, and then the Russians have this uh, dish that's called plof, and it's kind of a meat and rice carrots and onions dish, which is pretty, pretty tasty. So those were my favorites. Yep. Yeah, you. I just didn't know if there was anybody up there. Yeah, any other country? Yep, we are a, a big a conglomeration. And so the International Space Station is made up of the NASA, so the Americans, the Russian Space Agency, Russians, uh, the Japanese Space Agency, so we have Japanese astronauts, um, Canadian Space Agency, Canadian astronaut, and the European Space Agency, which is actually uh, about 16 countries that com uh, contribute to the human space flight side. So we've had a variety of Europeans from different countries up there. Right now there's a, a guy from Italy up on the space station. Yes, yeah. How do we go to the bathroom in space? Yeah, someone's always got to answer that, right? Um, so. Never underestimate the role that gravity plays on the ground when you go to the bathroom. Gravity is what gets waste away from your body. So in place of gravity, we use a very gentle airflow. We separate the liquids in the solids, but we have airflow to get the liquids to go into a tank. We actually recycle that. Um, so to make our drinking water and then the solids are put into a different tank that goes out with the trash. It's tricky. Thanks.